Martin. And okay. now we move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Julian Hecker. Um, he used to be in Bonn. Uh, he uh, transitioned to Boston. And um, he's a mathematician by training. Um, um, he's uh, uh, instructor at um, Harvard Medical School, and his current in interests are in family-based association studies um, on gene environment interactions with a special focus on lung-related uh, uh, phenotypes. So, uh, Julian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Today I would like, to, uh, would like to talk about a new methodology for gene environment interaction detection. And this is a joint work with my colleagues um, in the Channing Division of Network Medicine and the Harvard School of Public Health. And this is actually very much a work in progress. So I will talk about the methodology. We did some simulation studies and then I will talk shortly about first real data results in the UK Biobank. So as an introduction, um, as I guess everyone knows, for most complex diseases and traits, there is a genetic component and uh, an environmental component. But there's potentially also an interplay between the genetic factors and the environmental factors. And gene environment interaction can be roughly defined as a varying effect of a genotype on an outcome that depends on environmental factors. So that basically that the effect of the genotype is not the same for all the individuals because it depends on the environment. And the identification of such inter uh, gene environment interactions could uh, improve the understanding of biological mechanisms and also improve uh, risk predict prediction. That's what we also um, saw in the previous talk that, for example, for polygenic risk scores, gene environment interactions could be one, just one out of multiple factors that could explain why we see differences in the performance of polygenic risk scores across different populations. But uh, from a statistical point of view, the identification is challenging because uh, typically um, the power is limited because sample size, uh, the effect sizes are small and therefore large scale biobanks could be a good resource to identify um, gene environment interactions. So um, in this talk, I will talk about um, a quantitative trait model. So we are considering a quantitative trait as for example, a lung function, because we at the Channing Division of Network Medicine, we are doing research on asthma and COPD and their uh, lung function measurements, such as this FEV1 over FEC is a very important measurement. But it could also be height or body mass index or any other quantitative trait that can be measured. Um, in the model, there's also, of course, the genotype, and we look at environmental factors E and other covariates Z. And the model here is quite general. So we assume that, if, that there is um, an environmental main effect that I denote by this uh, term here. And then there's a genetic effect that could depend on environmental factors. So that means this is the environmental component of the phenotype and this is the genetic component. And if the genetic effect depends on the environment, this is what we want to call gene environment interaction. So the opposite, so basically if there's no gene environment interaction, then we would assume that um, the genetic effect is actually a constant. So that the, the effect of a spe specific genotype is the same for all the in individuals. And um, the standard approach to identify gene environment interactions would be to consider linear regression. Um, that basically means that we assume that both functions, the main effect, the environmental main effect, and the genetic effect, if they depend on the environmental factors, are linear in these terms. So basically replacing the unknown functions uh, mu and pi by these linear terms. And then to test for gene environment detection, you would perform a regression and then test if at least one of these coefficients from these products here between the environments and the genotypes is non-zero. 
And this is something you could do, for example, in uh, Plink. And if you have more than one environment factors, so if the dimension D of the environment is, is uh, above one, this is, of course, uh, a test that consists of different components. So um, you would do not just look at one coefficient, but multiple co coefficients and test the ISO set that at least one of them is non zero. So there are potential problems with this kind of approach. Although it's, of course, the standard approach that I guess um, is quite established. Um, the first problem is that if we misspecify the main environmental effect, this could lead to an increased type one error. Um, this was actually described in the literature uh, multiple times. And I would like to give an example here. Um, for example, if you look at lung function as a phenotype, um, I guess most people would include age, sex, height, and uh, smoking information in the model. And then, for example, uh, look for um, an interaction between smoking behavior and the geno genotype of interest. And here the problem is that smoking information can be measured in different ways. Uh, some re researchers use current smoking status uh, as smoking information. And some use, for example, pack years of smoking, which is a measurement that measures how much uh, people smoke in the past. And the problem is that if you, if you look at the environmental main effect, so basically these terms here, uh, it is actually very hard to model the effect, for example, of smoking on lung function, because to assume that there's a linear relationship between uh, the lung function measurement and pack years of, of smoking, for example, is very, very restrictive, actually. So that's why people sometimes like to include uh, a, a quadratic term. And in the previous talk, we also saw h and h squared. That is also quite um, reasonable. And um, so the bottom line is that it's actually quite hard to really know what is the real form of the uh, environment domain effect. And the problem is, if we misspecify this model, so basically do it wrong, uh, this could lead to the identification of a smoking by gene in interaction that is just uh, because we misspecified the main effect. So it would be a type one error. And there's of course something we would like to avoid. The other problem is that um, if we misspecify the genetic effect model, so pi, uh, this would lead to a power loss because uh, obviously because if we don't capture the full variation of the genetic effect, uh, and test for interaction, uh, we would re lose power uh, compared to the scenario where we would know the exact form of the genetic effect. And the other problem is that um, most of the time, of course, um, we don't know which environment, environment factors do interact with the genotype. So this would, would, this would lead to the scenario where we include multiple environment factors, and then as I said, test that at least one of them is not zero. And if the number of environmental factors grows, the power decreases because you have more no noise in the model because you would assume that um, many of these environmental factors do not interact with the genotype, but you don't know which, which of them have maybe an effect. And so to address these two issues, um, we thought about the new methodology for gene environment interaction detection. And this new method is based on a test procedure. It's basically an algorithm and that has multiple steps. And in order to understand why we need these multiple steps, um, I would like to emphasize that our method is based on uh, three different points, or basically facts or observations. So the first one is that we need more flexibility in the model. That means that we would like to incorporate nonlinear effects, for example, H squared, or the smoking behavior squared, or even the logarithm uh, of, of smoking behavior, and uh, things like that. So um, this is something we would like to have in the model. But as I said, if we increase um, the model complexity, uh, we should also allow or um, try to exploit sparsity. That means that we know that we have many variables in the model, but probably most of them do not have an effect. And we need to be able to learn which, which factors have an effect on the outcome or basically play, play a role in the genetic effect. 
And therefore our approach, or one possible approach to um, address this issue is uh, based on spline regression. That basically means that we replace the linear terms in the regression by polynomials. So higher order moments of the uh, environmental variables. And then you combine this approach with a penalization or a regularization approach like the lasso. And here on the right, um, just to give an idea, uh, it's a very simple example, of course. I plotted um, in, in black some points from a, from a simulated data set. And then in uh, blue, I tried to fit the model based on a linear regression with just the uh, variable as a linear form. And then in red, I uh, fitted the model based on higher order moments, also including the fourth moment. And we can see that this, of course, uh, pretty much improves the fit of the data, uh, of the model to the data. And this would also lead to an improved uh, power to detect for gene environment detection. But um, the problem is that we are looking at different models here and we try to allow for a lot of flexibility. And therefore we would like to choose the best model based on some, on, on some criteria. And from a statistical point of view, if you talk about choosing the best model from multiple models, of course, this is, uh, sounds, like, sounds like cheating. So that basically makes it complicated or even sometimes infeasible to perform significance testing for the interaction afterward. Because if we, for example, would choose the best model in terms of getting the best p-value for the interaction, this is not a valid approach because this would be p-value cheating. And um, of course, one approach that is out there in the, in the field is sample splitting. Um, so we would split the data set into multiple parts or for the start in two parts, and then estimate and train these models in the first subsample. And after selecting the best model, we go to the second part of the data and test for interactions in the second part. And because this is independent data, we would get a valid p-value if we are able to come up with a method to test for interaction in the second part, uh, data set part. And the third point is robustness. And this is actually quite uh, important for our methodology. And the background is the following. So if you, in general, increase the flexibility of a statistical model, you increase the variance. This is the so-called bias variance trade-off um, and could lead to much, much, much slower convergence rates. So that's, for example, I guess, um, I guess most people know, for example, if you, if you use machine learning approaches, of course, they are quite flexible. They can basically model a lot of different things, but they need a lot of uh, large sample sizes to converge because um, yeah, if you increase the model complexity, it's, it's much, much harder to find good estimates. So the variance is, is increased. And this usually translates from a theoretical point of view in sl uh, slow convergence rates. But if we go from our first subsample to the second subsample and then try to test for uh, interaction and we would use the standard score test for gene environment interaction that uh, would look like this. Uh, this test would fail. And why? So the intuition uh, is that under the null hypothesis, so basically that there is no gene environment interaction, and if you assume that the convergence is actually fast, when we look at this term here, where we take the phenotype and then subtract the main environment effect, and the constant, because we are talking about the null hypothesis, the constant genotype effect, we would end up with approximately the residual error. And then if we would uh, evaluate the test statistic here, this would have a uh, mean zero, basically unbiased statistic for, the uh, for testing gene environment in action. So I put this here in quotes because please do not understand this as rigorous mathematical statements. It's more just to get the idea um, of this approach. Because if we talk about the case that I just described, that the, we have a slow convergence because we have increased model flexibility, we have to assume that in general, even after subtracting the main environmental effect, uh, 
in the genetic effect, the constant genetic effect, we would end up with the standard error plus um, maybe terms that still depend on the environmental factors or the genetic factors. And if we would put this now into this test, test statistic, you would see that um, this would lead to a test statistic that doesn't have mean, mean of zero. Basically, this would lead to an increased type 1 error because this would look like gene environment interaction. And what was developed in a similar context uh, for very general interaction studies is um, a so-called robust statistic. It's a, it's a multiple robust statistic. And the idea is that we take the genetic factor here and the estimated um, genet genetic effect and perform two kinds of transformations uh, for these two quantities such that the product here is orthogonal to functions that depend either only on the environmental effect or only on the genetic effect, uh, genetic factors. And therefore, we would get an unbiased statistic if there is no gene environment interaction, even if there is slight misspecification of the main effects. Because if um, the remaining part here would depend on the product, product terms between the estimated genetic effect and the genetic factor, this test statistic would still have uh, a mean of not zero, basically would have power to test for gene environment interaction. But this is just for um, the technical details. But uh, as I said, this leads us to our general test procedure. Um, so in the first step, we split the data into three approximately equally sized random subsamples. Then we take the first subsample to estimate our model. So basically getting estimates for the main effect model of the environment and the genetic effect. Then we go to the second subsample, estimate or learn there the first transformation that was described here. And then we go to the, to the last part of the data set, so the third subsample, and estimate the second transformation and evaluate the test statistic that is just described here. So this would give us a test for gene environment interaction that is robust to misspecifications of the main effects and would have, uh, hopefully have power to detect gene environment, uh, gene environment interaction if there is interaction. But this would only use um, one third of the data set. So therefore, in, the, in step number five, we swap the roles of the subsamples twice. So basically giving different um, roles for the different subsamples and repeat the steps two to four. And then in the end, we have three different sub uh, statistics uh, based on the three different subsamples. And then we take, take the sum of the sub, uh, sub, uh, statistics as the overall statistic. And if we do so uh, from a theoretical point of view under the null hypothesis and some reasonable assumptions about the behavior of different objects that I ignore here uh, just to get, to get the uh, result here, um, is that the test statistic is unbiased. These sub statistics are asymptotically independent and therefore uh, the variance of the test statistic can be estimated by a very, very simple sample variance estimator. And in, in the end, if we standardize the test statistic S, we can also show that this is asymptotically normal. So basically, we have a test statistic that uses full data by a mechanism that flips around subsamples. And then in the end, we get a very simple test statistic that can be evaluated against the uh, not, um, asymptotic normal distribution to test for gene environment interaction. So one thing I would like to emphasize here is that this actually borrows a lot of approach uh, things from um, the recent literature in causal inference and epidemiology. So as I said, multiple robot statistics were described in Van Steelen 2008. And um, these other two papers are also very, uh, very important in the, in the causal inference and treatment effect literature. And so basically what we do here is we take 
um, all these approaches and put them together in our context of gene environment interaction. And one, what is really important is that the estimation is the first step and the second step can be based on any suitable machine learning based approach. And the selection is based on, on cross validation uh, usually. So you could also, for example, look at local linear random forests and other things. It just needs to be uh, ensured that you are able to distinguish between um, gen genetic effects and the main effects. So we did some simulations where we compared our approach to the standard linear regression that I showed in the first previous slides, uh, first slides, and the uh, mixed model approach called struct LMM that was published, I think, in Nature Genetics last year. And we looked at um, 60,000 samples. And for the type 1 error, uh, we looked at different combinations of population certification, so where we used principal components to correct for the certification, and misspecified environment, environment domain effects, and different types of gene environment correlation. So gene environment correlation can occur when um, either the, the certification introduces correlation between environment and the gen, uh, genetic factors, or if the genetic variant has an impact on the environment itself. For example, in smoking uh, by gene interaction, if the genetic effect has an impact of, on smoking, and then both have an interaction effect on for example, lung function, we would like to distinguish between the gene environment correlation and the gene environment interaction. So we, we performed this type one error analysis. So these are the results based on empirical type one error rates uh, for 1,000 replicates at a significant level of 1%. And as you can see in the, in the plain scenario with only population certification, all methods can control for population certification. Of course, assuming that the principal components are uh, correct enough. And, but we can see if you misspecify it, uh, the, mis the environmental effect, there is an increased type 1 error for the struct LM and the regression-based uh, methodology. And our method that is described here in the last column always holds the type 1 error. We also looked at some power results. Uh, so this is very much work in progress. Um, here I included three different scenarios. So in the quadratic uh, scenario, we have a quadratic genetic effect. So I basically was a bit unfair here to the regression and the struct LM because basically it's a design in a way where the regression and the mixed model based approach cannot have power because uh, they, they cannot fit uh, the real genetic effect based on a linear model. So here we have a lot of uh, lo uh, much more power than the other approaches. But if we look at the linear uh, term, so basically the linear models that only look at linear terms have a slight advantage and there uh, the regression and the structure them basically have more power than our approach. But I think we can uh, actually work on that and improve um, the estimation step to, to capture this a bit better. So I think there's still potential to, to close this gap here. And the second uh, scenario in the middle is a product term where I would say the results are quite similar um, but there's also like um, some, some space for improvements. So as I said, as a very uh, first real data application, we looked at some data in the UK Biobank for lung function. So there were two publications. One, of, one is from my colleagues, actually. They looked at uh, lung function and COPD. So I uh, extracted 10 genome-wide significant hits for lung function and the corresponding four significant corresponding genes in um, in the TWAS universe, basically. And there was another paper that described um, three different SNPs for lung function that have variance effects. So basically, it's a screen for genetic effects that have an effect on the phenotypic, phenotypic variance. And this is an indication for gene environment interaction. So overall, I extracted 11 SNPs after ID pruning because of some of these SNPs overlapped. And then I applied our method, um, yeah, based on UK Biobank data, was approximately 200,000 samples. For lung function, I included uh, principal components, height, age, and the geno uh, genotyping array. And as environmental factors, we included sex, current smoking, pack years of smoking, and the four predicted gene expression components. So this is from the from the T-Wars um, approach. And so here, um, 
these uh, three different SNPs were actually the ones that are described in the variance QTL paper. And for these papers, we found highly or slightly significant uh, interactions. And uh, we looked at model terms that are identified by our approach. And these indicate that there might be an uh, interaction with pack years of smoking, sex, and maybe also some kind of different genes on different chromosomes. That would be actually quite interesting. And um, the plan is to look at this in a bit more detail uh, in the next weeks. So uh, I would like to also emphasize that, OK, in this talk here, I talked about single variants as a genetic effector. But this could also be extended to uh, polygenic risk scores or other gene set based scores, for example, as in the TWAS universe. Um, so basically, was, this will just replace either the, gen the genetic effect by the uh, score, or we would perform the step for all the variants separately and then putting things together in the testing step. So basically having a weighted, weighted polygenic risk score, weighted by the environment effectors. Um, and I think it could also be very interesting to look at TWAS components, so basically the predicted gene expression for some genes uh, instead of the project risk scores. Because I think uh, if you want to increase gene environment interaction power, you usually uh, have more power if you, if you look at um, these genetic set-based scores because they have more variation. So some remarks. Uh, so we didn't distinguish here gene environment interaction and effect modification because um, so the difference is that basically if we identify something that interacts with genetic factors, it doesn't mean that this is a causal relationship. It could also be just an approximate variable for some other factors. So, but we, we, we stick to the basically the, the standard definition of talking about gene environment detection, even though I think from a purely statistical point of view, it's more like an effect modification. There are potential improvements in the estimation step uh, we would like to include simulations based on real data. We would also like to look at uh, the estimated genetic effects to identify important interacting factors. Of course, we need more applications to the UK Biobank data. Uh, maybe we also can extend this to, uh, to case control data. And last but not least, of course, um, it would be helpful to publish this uh, in the framework of an R package to make it available. And they are also actually quite. Uh, it's I, I would say it's an ongoing, yeah, topic in, in, in the literature. Actually, there was a paper yesterday uh, or no, uh, on Monday, I think, um, in the American of human uh, American Journal of Human Genetics, and there's also a new paper by the people from uh, Regenerin that are trying to do similar stuff, but also still based on linear terms. So that's also something that we would like to include in, in the comparison. And with this, I would like to thank everyone involved. I would like to th thank uh, the organizers of this conference and uh, thank you. I hope I was on time. Okay, Julian, thanks a lot. So you must have done a pretty good job because you showed some formulas, but you didn't lose anyone in the audience. So we still have more than 100 uh, listeners. Um, could you comment on how you identified the gene-gene interactions, which you mentioned for some of the SNPs? Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, so I talked about gene environment interactions, but the environmental component could also be replaced by a gene, right? By, for example, we thought about it maybe it would make sense to do not look at gene by gene uh, in terms of two pairs of SNPs, but maybe just one SNP of interest, and then the predicted gene expression, which is basically just a weighted linear combination of different SNPs. Mm -hmm. Because I think this could have more power because maybe on the gene-based level, things are more powerful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you um, estimate the D um, and did you look at it for other uh, phenotypes too? So for example, height as we discussed in the previous discussion uh, session um, talk? Uh, not yet, but of course, yeah, most papers that are uh, looking for gene environment interactions uh, are considering height or BMI. So that's something we would, would like to do, but we didn't do it yet because, um, yeah, in the chaining division of network medicine, we are very much interested in the lung function. So that's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, which is obviously also of high clinical importance. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. So we will continue with the discussion in the Q&A session.
And now I'd like to introduce you 